Major support for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. And Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Immigration, health care, and infrastructure, all critical to improving lifestyle as we know it here in the Carolinas. But also, now that we're free and clear of the holidays, grappling with these issues have taken center stage in our nation's public debate. And of those three issues, which one gets done first? Welcome again. Thank you so much for supporting the longest running and the most widely watched source of Carolina business policy and public affairs seen every week across North and South Carolina for 28 years. And Amazon winnows its potential new HQ site to include only one Carolina Metro. Fallout from the Scana Santee Cooper reorganization is far from over in South Carolina. And in a moment, our expert panel starts this week's discussion. And then later, the CEO of Asheville's Mission Health, Dr. Ron Paulus. Gratefully acknowledging support by Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. Please visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at Bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Otis Rawl from the Greater Lexington Chamber and Visitor Center. Tim Quinlan, Senior Economist from Wells Fargo Securities. And special guest, Vaughn Paulus, President and CEO of Mission Health. Uh, welcome to our program. Tim, good to have you here. Odie, welcome back. Glad to be here. Uh, surprised at all about HQ's decision, I I'm sorry, Amazon's decision to, to clearly put Raleigh on a not so short list of 20 cities and not Charlotte? Well, from our perspective, I'm not real sure what, they're, what they were evaluating the, the towns and cities on. If you're looking at uh, what's happening in the triangle up there and what's happened with the universities and they're trying to gather the information and the resources around that, it makes sense. But if you look at population, distribution, and things of that yeah, sort, transportation, it would, so, transportation yeah. makes a lot more sense to be in a bigger metropolitan area than, than what they're located. But uh, you, know, you really don't know what corporations are looking at when they start looking at uh, relocating, particularly headquarters and facilities. Yeah, you, so that brings up a good point, Otis. You've been down this road with a lot of relo, corporate relos for a long time in the Palmetto State. Is, has this process been dramatically different? Well, I think originally the corporations themselves came in and did the research. Now they got site folks that go in and evaluate locations and make recommendations to them. So it really depends on how the state uh, economic development folks are linked in with these site selectors and who's making the decision. And, uh, you know, sometimes it comes down to as simple as, you know, what's available, what's the corporate CEO want, what, I mean, I've even seen where their wife kind of makes the decision of where they want to be, where they want to be close to the mountains or the beach or whether they be in the south or the midwest or northeast. So there's a lot of parameters go in it, but lots of times I think the site, site selectors have more input into it than anything else. Tim, what do you think? I mean, economists, I know you're not an economic developer, but I mean, when you, when you saw that, that the process was unfolding with Amazon, they did it very publicly from day one, and now we've got 20 on the list. It's Raleigh and not Charlotte. Yeah, I mean, obviously the in-state rivalry there, I was personally disappointed in it, but um, as, as Otis kind of said, professionally, you're kind of surprised. Charlotte's you know, somewhat unique in that it's a, a pretty big city that's not on a major waterway, and it's achieved that because of its historical status as a transportation hub from the intersection of the Indian trade routes at Trade and Tryon to the, you know, the, the rail era to all the investment in the airport in the, in the early years to, um, you know, where we are today. It's, it, it seems like it's a um, much closer to the major metropolitan areas. Um, mm -hmm. Seems like the more viable choice. Otis, uh, back to something very 
very publicly that's going on in the you know the, the harsh light of the public eye is now uh, SCANA has obviously going through its reorganization a chapter of 11 a chapter 11 of some sorts uh, because of the nuclear facility that just did not work out it is billions upon billions that will cost not just ratepayers but shareholders reputation of lawmakers and those that led SCANA Santee Cooper South Carolina Electric and Gas uh, how does this end up I'm not real sure anybody knows right now. If you'd asked me four or five months ago when the hearings were going on, Scanner would be sold, Dominion would be in. But I think cooler heads have, have stepped up to the plate now. All the emotion that surrounded it back during the summer has kind of waned a little bit. The legislative uh, houses have set up committees to go back and look at the Dominion offer look at keeping SCANA as they are. You know, I, I reckon I'm a little bit biased in this, but uh, we don't have that many Fortune 1000 uh, companies in South Carolina, which SCANA has been one, and they've been in our state for over 150 years. So I'd like to find some type of resolution where we could keep that company there, being mindful of we've, we've got to address the issues with, with the rate payers and what's happened. But I think we can get all mixed up in this whole thing. I think when SCANA made their decision to build those nuclear plants, it was the right decision. And the Baseload Review Act uh, that was passed that everybody's being real critical of that allowed us to finance some of the uh, expense of putting, it, putting the plant together and not capitalizing that whole cost at one time where you go from a two or three uh, percent increase this year versus a 50% one-time cost right. that has really got a shock factor to it. So there's a lot of things that went into it. I mean, I don't want to get into the mismanagement or how they manage the project and all, but I think that'll come to light and you'll see them address three different issues. They're dealing with the regulatory side of it now with uh, the Public Service Commission, ORS. They'll deal with how they go, uh, f whether they go approve Dominion's buyout. But Do you think in, Dominion will ultimately be the acquirer of these assets? I, I'm not real sure on that. We've been talking with them, and if you talk to legislators, they're, they're really concerned about whether Dominion's uh, proposal is, is really enough to stave off uh, any type of bankruptcy or they could pay the rate payers back enough to stabilize everything. Uh, Dr. Quinlan, as an economic scientist, and you look at this, do you see anything that could be a shock to the system for an economy, or is there an, another observation that's maybe not as overt that's, uh, that's important to see? You know, frankly, I don't think I've got any real particular insights on that. I think that, you know, it's the, it's the kind of thing that, I guess, you know, it, it pushed me to, to say what's the, the broader takeaway here is, you know, investment in nuclear has the potential to, you know, generate a lot of electricity at a, you know, minimal impact to the environment. And it's, you know, yet another hurdle now for, for new investment in that space. Uh, just quickly, and we'll bring our guests on. Uh, this idea now that the, the next HQ2 is coming, uh, the tsunami is, is Apple. Apple's announced that they want to look for a headquarters. Is this, uh, Tim, is this on your radar? Is this something that could show up and, and the Carolinas will get queue up for something like this? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you look at a map of the United States, you know, look where these headquarters are today and, you know, where, where could it viably be? Um, you know, you're, you're going to pick a spot on the East Coast and now you want to go to the Northeast where you've got shrinking population and high legacy costs or do you want to be in the, the Southeast where, you know, by and large, you've got positive population growth um, by most measures, a more desirable weather situation, mm -hmm. net in migration, lower legacy costs. Um, I think that, that brightens prospects across the Southeast. You sound like an economic developer when you that way. I converted him in just 10 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Otis is a convincing guy. <laughs> yeah, he, he's had your ear now for a while. That's right. Uh, Otis, in about a minute, tax reform. Uh, as you talk to your, your constituents, not just in Lexington, yep. Columbia, uh, but across the state, is this, been a, is this going to be a good thing in South Carolina? I think, yeah, f first, the short answer is yes. And I think we're all already beginning to see, and Tim and I were talking a little bit earlier, we've had some major corporations that are already given incremental increases in salaries. Uh, to employees that, uh, uh, to their employees. I think the second thing is, is we really got to wait to see what the insuring of all these trillions of dollars is gonna do to our economy and whether it's gonna take off or whether it's just gonna kind of sit there and whether they go buy equipment, create jobs, uh, create uh, investment, pay dividends and how all that washes through the system. But I mean, I, I, if you look at tax reform, anytime you reduce the liability of an individual and you free up capital money, 
for them to spend on capital or, or things of that sort. It's got to be great for the economy. And I mean, just look at what's happening in 12, 15 months. We're up over 26,000, you know, with the Dow. And I, people got to be better off now than they were 12, 13 months ago. And the unemployment uh, uh, rate and the, and the number of requests for unemployment insurance is way down. Mm -hmm. So our, our employment is up, it's stable. Everything's just good, and, and with tax reform, I just think it's going to continue. You to, think it's more wind at the back? Oh, yeah. You know, it's just it's forensically just about 30 seconds, and I, I know I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this, but, it, you know, I've got to think about the idea that North Carolina lost the bid for the Toyota plant to Alabama. Mm -hmm. And I, it's hard to not consider that South Carolina has already dialed in on the aerospace and the automotive supply mm -hmm. chain. Right. What, wouldn't it have made sense for North and South Carolina to work together on this to say South Carolina's has got the talent, North Carolina's got the incentive and maybe the site or a joint site, but it seems like that would have been a good opportunity for the states to actually come together and do something on that. Well, I, I think there's regional partnerships going on all over the place. I think the last time we talked, we talked about rail partnership and what yeah. Charlotte and Rock Hill and doing. I, I think re people really look regionally now. When you look at companies, particularly foreign companies, uh, they don't look at South Carolina, particularly or North Carolina, they look to go into a region. And, and, and the Southeast is just so strong right now. And going back to Tim's comment about the uh, inward migration, you just take the Charleston, Dorchester, Berkeley area, 35 families are moving down there daily because of Volvo, Mercedes, and Boeing. And uh, I don't know how you get governments to do that because of the competition. And you know our commerce department's competitive. Our governor's competitive. Uh, it, it, it's hard it to turn that working. off. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, we're going to bring our guest out in just a moment. Coming up next week on this program, uh, uh, Don Flo. Flo Automotive is a, is a family of car dealerships uh, that dwarf some of the other families of car dealerships. A longtime old family from Winston Salem. Don Flo will be here. Also, Gene Woods uh, leads one of the largest health care providers, not just in the Carolinas but the country. That's Carolina's healthcare system. Uh, new CEO Gene Woods will be here. And then Mikey Johnson from Cox Industries in South Carolina is back again. The rub between providers, hospitals, and payers, insurers, has been the fuel for countless news headlines and arguments that the healthcare system is dysfunctional or at minimum ineffectual. Are we on a bureaucratic hamster wheel or is the public policy debate getting us closer to a better system? Are we making progress or is our proverbial scene from the movie Groundhog Day? Someone who has not been shy and speaking candidly is Mission Health Chief Executive Officer Dr. Ron Paulus. Dr. Paulus, welcome from Asheville. Good to Thank have you. you. Uh, Dr. Paulus, this, this idea of, you know, the public sees this debate around health care. They experience it in the system. They hear about it. They read the news headlines. Are, are we really moving the ball forward? Or it seems like there's a lot of debate going back and forth and punches in some cases being exchanged. But are we getting a better system? I think it depends upon what perspective you frame that question from. Uh, at the policy level, uh, my view is that it's probably even worse than a hamster wheel uh, because the yin-yang between we're going to do the Affordable Care Act, we're going to repeal the Affordable Care Act, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, it's back and forth. And any business knows that uh, planning clarity is an essential element of being able to really transform and move the ball down the field. On the other hand, uh, there are other really substantive transformative activities underway, including uh, most notably uh, technology firms. So when we look at mm -hmm. uh, Apple- Within healthcare? Yeah. yeah within healthcare. Yeah. When we look at, uh, you know, the, the, new, uh, the newest version of the Apple Watch and the health kit now enables uh, direct transmission of EKG signals whenever we look at the ability to remotely monitor patients in their home. So th it's almost like two parallel universes, one that's as dysfunctional as humanly possible, which is evidenced by where we are in the government shutdown debate, and then this other one that's acting like these things don't really exist, and we're going to try to solve these problems. Yeah. Odie? Hey, Dr. Paul, thanks for being here, and yeah. uh, nice to have met you. I think the real issue is, you know, 
as a chamber, I represent insurance companies, hospitals, and local business guys. And then Good luck start, with all that. Uh, with all that. So <laughs> kind of be kind of be nimble today. But, uh, you know, I think the real issue when you start talking about debate is how we go pay for services. And historically, we've been under a fee-based system mm -hmm. where you pay for the service you get rather than a holistic approach to health care where, you know, we say, all right, we go pay just for like $10,000 to look after this individual versus every time they go to the doctor, there's a fee. Your thoughts on that, is that is, is holistic payments and health care, is that the future or do we still stay in a fee-based type system that we know hasn't worked in the past? Right, so uh, great question, uh, terrific insight. The, the, uh, I believe firmly and, and deeply uh, in my heart and DNA that moving to a more holistic payment model is the only way that things can transform from where they are today. Yeah. On the other hand, we face all kinds of challenges that insurers aren't ready to actually do that, even when they say that yeah. they are. Uh, and um, just to give you an example, an, a quick example, uh, under the Medicaid program, we uh, uh, care for lots of women and children. Right. Uh, in our neonatal intensive care unit, about 10% or more of the babies are born opioid addicted, uh, tragically. Oh, yeah. uh, that's a very difficult uh, problem in an infant. Wow. Uh, and we developed a, a method to detox those babies at home out of the hospital. Gets them away from the risk, lowers the cost dramatically. What do we get back? for that. Uh, our reimbursement is cut by millions of dollars. Yeah. We don't get a cent for doing it. We do the right thing, but that's the kind of perverse incentives that we have yeah. and we have to face each and every day of the week. There's not a day goes by where I don't have to make a decision that's really not the right decision, but I've got to keep the doors open. You know, one of the things I think about is um, demographic trends, the fact that the over 70 crowd is going to be the fastest growing Indeed. segment of the population over the next 20 years. And, you know, people, one of the questions I'll get a lot is, you know, what should I do with my, my kids in college? What should they major in? And, you know, is healthcare kind of a safe field to go into? And the thinking there is with all the septuagenarians growing faster, there'll be increased demand for this stuff. And yet, as Otis and I were talking earlier about the increase of um, mechanization and robots and um, wh when you look at the, the healthcare industry, do you, you know, what, you know, are, are nurses safe or do you see the capacity for uh, technology to start replacing jobs? Yes, I think it's a little bit of both, but uh, when you look at uh, the demographics, as you just described, not just of the population writ large, but also of the caregivers. Uh, so um, there's, uh, we're heading towards a bit of a nursing crisis with respect to re retirements that are coming versus the supply of nurses uh, that are coming out. Uh, we have uh, very significant challenges with physician supply, most notably because when I when I was in medical school, it was the first time that females were equal to the number of males in medical school. It's now crossed over where there are more females than males. Without getting into judgments, the reality is that females practice less than males do in terms of number of hours, so the productivity uh, units are lower. In addition, males have also dropped their productivity so that uh, a new male medical graduate uh, the, the thought is it takes about one and a half new medical uh, grads to replace a single retiring grad on a productivity basis. They, they have different mm -hmm. lifestyle choices and trade-offs. So I think the healthcare uh, career is safe for quite a long time, yeah. uh, but uh, it may not be as hospital-based. It may be more uh, community-based. Lots of opportunities, just different forms. I, I don't want to leave this idea of insurance companies, payers and hospitals, payers and providers. Uh, people have described you as a reasonable guy, smart guy, passionate guy but yet you had this you had this moment where you called an insurance company like Blue Cross Blue Shield the most most unethical bullying foe that you've ever faced where did that level of frustration come from not it, it and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth Dr. Paulus but not just from the from trying to negotiate a rate but how, how do you find yourself in that frustrating point of view that would and I know those were private internal comments, but still you made them. Mm. So where did that come from? Yeah, so that, that's a fair question. And, uh, you know, in hindsight, I wished I'd uh, chosen uh, my words more carefully. It was a private communication that became public and, you know, so be it. But 
the frustration is easy to describe, uh, and it relates in large part to sort of the unfairness of the demographic world. So in Western North Carolina, we're older, poorer, sicker, less likely to be insured than state and national averages. The over 80 population is the fastest growing subsegment of our population. And the dirty secret of health care is that uh, state and federal governments intentionally price uh, their payment for services well below the cost. Uh, if you look at MedPAC, which is the advisory body to Congress today, they would say that the average hospital has a negative 11% margin on mm -hmm. Medicare. Mm -hmm. so, so when you add up uh, for mission, the fact that we have 70% of our patients Medicare and Medicaid and another 5% uninsured, we lose money on 75% of our business. I don't know how many businesses could operate if they did that. Mm. Uh, the quid pro quo then is that we have to shift costs onto commercial insurers. And, and we have a lot fewer commercial insurers to shift costs to than Charlotte or Raleigh-Durham does. Because and, of the rural nature of Western North Carolina? And because of the, pe the, the people, right? That the, they're older, poorer, sick, or less likely to be insured. There are fewer employers. Uh, an employer in Asheville of 100 is a large employer, uh, right? So, so uh, where we've gotten to is that on a weighted average pricing basis, we start out assuming that we got uh, a fair increase, an inflationary increase from uh, in, uh, commercial insurers. We're at 1 to 1.5% 1 net. But our input costs for drugs are rising at 9 to 12 percent. Our wage and, and benefit costs are rising at 3.5 to 4 percent. Our medical supplies are 6 percent. That negative arbitrage between our pricing capacity and our input costs creates a massive dilemma. And that's not sustainable. How, and you can't just merge your way into being profitable, can you? No. Uh, you know, we would benefit from uh, greater back office scale efficiencies. I think if you looked at us on a clinical uh, performance basis, we've been uh, named one of the top 15 health systems in f five of the last six years, never been done before. Our, our Medicare loss on average negative margin is about 4% versus this national average of 11%. We're already more efficient. Uh, but uh, we have engineered and re-engineered our clinical processes to be state-of-the-art. But we have limitations on what we can do with the back office supply chain, with revenue cycle, with IT, uh, that we're going to have to get uh, mm -hmm. better at. Mm -hmm. Dr. Paul, I, you know, I sit there and I listen to you talk and I listen to any type of caregiver versus the reimbursement part. And of course, Blue Cross Blue Shield manages the, the, the benefits that our guys are paying for. So they're actually managing our money. Mm. And you know, we're still looking at 17, 18, this past year, 17, 18% increase from, from our little chamber of commerce in our, in our, in our, in our health care. I mean, it, it's an, as Chris said, it's a non-sustainable model Yes. So what we're going to move to, or we, and this is, I'm going to get to the question, <laughs> we're not going to be able to afford it, right. okay, before too much longer because of the growth. What's your thought, thoughts about single payer? Because, you know, if you look at most of the countries that are the economic development countries, they have some type of single payer system, okay? Uh, we have historically as businesses and as a country been against single payer, even though Affordable Health Care Act moved us toward that. How do we answer the question of rising pharmaceutical costs, rising clinical costs in hospitals, rising cost of doctors? Business is just going to have to fold in, and then you're not going to have that 25% that's going to be paying for your other 75%. How do we answer that question? Yeah, so it's a great question. If I could just briefly comment on your first statement, which you, you sort of made the point I've been making for the last uh, uh, year, which is your prices are you're getting charged 18% more, and I can't get an inflationary increase. So you ask me where the you, you tell me where the money's going. P putting that aside. Uh, you're right, right, that it's not sustainable. Although I reflect back when I was a, a sophomore in college, uh, I took a course at the University of Pennsylvania that led to my career uh, called Healthcare System 001. Back then, the professor was saying, healthcare is at 8.5% of GDP. Yeah. And if, if we don't do something, it's going to be at 10, and then everything's going to go to hell in a handbasket. So yeah. here we are. Uh, I do think that uh, single payer is going to be the default if we don't yeah. get our act together. Uh, I will note that when you look at other countries, they talk about the U.S. Uh, spending so much more. It's true that we spend a lot more on health care. If you add together health care and social services, 
and sum those together, we're right in the middle of the pack and sometimes even being less. Gotcha. Uh, so, um, you know, we're doing some new things. We opened up a new practice uh, downtown Asheville called Avenue Health. Uh, the uh, uh, design is that 80% of that practice is going to be virtual. It's paid on a monthly subscription basis that's lower than most people's deductibles. Uh, and it bundles in things like basic labs, basic drugs, mm -hmm. basic imaging. Yeah. And so we're trying to create new models of care. Uh, Mission is like the canary in the coal mine with our payer mix. Uh, if I were in Charlotte and had 45% commercial, I wouldn't have to do any of this stuff. Right. Uh, but it's it's good, and I enjoy trying to transform care. So, so we got less. I'm sorry, Tim. I'm going to have to take it. We have less than a minute left. So, is that Avenue Health in downtown Asheville? Does that? Can you tell now? that that is going to be a successful model? And you've got about 10 seconds. Yeah, I can't tell now, but I am confident that's gonna be a successful model for a subset of the population. So, so the arc is towards success and you'll be able to scale that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for being on the program. Nice to see you again. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tim, welcome to the program. The facial hair is new, but uh, we'd <laughs> like you to come back sometime. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, of course. That's just because I can't do it. Otis, good to see you again. It's thank good you to see you too, program. Chris. Uh, thank you for watching our program. Until next week, we hope your weekend is good, dry, and certainly warm. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, Bearings, Grant Thornton, Novant Health, Sunoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.